All right, brethren, let's go to Psalm 87. Psalm 87. I love the Psalms, and I think the Lord's people grow to love the Psalms more and more. We see our prayers in David's prayers. We see our Redeemer in the Psalms. We see the various circumstances and situations and trials and we can relate to those and I just think the, the older God's people get, the more you find yourself going to the Psalms and finding great comfort there. And Psalm 87 is a comforting psalm. This is giving the Lord God in Christ all the praise for His church, for His holy city. He says in verse 3, Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. Now this is to be understood figuratively when we think of a, of a city. It's a true city. It's a real city. It's a spiritual city. But the Lord's church is compared in Scripture to a city called the city of God. Now the church is God's holy city. It's the holy city of of Zion. It's made up of His chosen, redeemed, regenerated people that have been saved by God's grace. It's all God's building. He, he purposed it. He, he set it in order. He, he builds this city. It's all of His doing. It's where He dwells. It's where the Lord dwells. It's called Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there. It's where He dwells. Now, the church of God, when we think about the church of God, this is important because there's some that, that say the church is only the local assembly. The church of God is both the local assembly and the universal church. That's very important. The local church is an assembly that God has assembled. His elect his regenerated people that he's assembled by his spirit, by his gospel, where he's brought them together. That's the local church. He makes us to worship. He gives us true worship. When we really worship in the heart, he does it. He assembles his people and his ordinances are maintained in the church by the grace of our Lord. The church of God's also universal. The universal church of God is called the city of God. The city of God. It, the citizens of this city are God's elect in every generation. Every generation. They're in heaven. They're in earth. It's, this is the whole city. Paul speaks of the universal church when he says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's all his elect throughout all time. Beginning to end. All of them. The universal church is described in Hebrews 12 when he says Mount Zion, he's called it Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Some are in heaven already, the spirits of just men made perfect, some are in the earth, but that's the whole universal church, the city of God, the Zion of God. So this psalm speaking of his church. is speaking of God's church, the holy city in heaven and in earth. And that's our subject, the glory of God's city. Now the psalm easily divides itself into three parts. And these will be our divisions. First we'll see the provider and foundation of this city. And then we'll see the citizens of this city. And then we'll see the rejoicing of this city. Now let's look here first at the glorious provider and foundation of this city. He says in verse 1, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. Now every city has to have a planner. A city planner is somebody that's going to Mark out where things are going to be built and where the best place is to build buildings and how the best use of the land will be and the resources and what have you. And a city also has to have a good foundation. 
uh, Venice, Italy. I don't want to if anybody lives in Venice or knows anybody lives in Venice, but they must have not had a good planner because it's not, it's not built on a good foundation. It's a sinking city. New Orleans, it's below sea level. Yeah. But it's not so with the city of God. It has a good planner who made a solid foundation for his city. The Lord Jehovah laid Zion's foundation on the rock Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Verse 1 says, His foundation is in the holy mountains. In Isaiah 28, verse 16, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. He shall not be ashamed and confounded for trusting on the Lord. Paul said, Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. His foundation is laid in the holy mountains. Christ Jesus is that foundation that the Lord God laid from eternity. Talking about the ultimate preeminent city planner. This was before anything was made that was made. In eternity, he laid the foundation. How did he do that? The Father chose the Son. He chose His Son, and in doing so, He laid the foundation of His church. The Father looked to the Son, and in, by choosing a people in His Son, all His holy mountains were established on Christ the rock from eternity. When Christ entered covenant to save His people, He became the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. Before one thing was created, before one sinner sinned, God already determined the end from the beginning. Now that's a solid foundation. Christ would not fail. It was all predetermined by God who He would save and who would do the saving and that He would lose none. The foundation was settled from before the foundation of the world. That's what Paul meant when he said, when he chose us in Christ in heavenly places before the world was made, he blessed us with all spiritual blessings because all of them are in Christ. And he is the one who will guarantee all his people are saved and receive all the blessings. So in time, he came. The Lord came. And he took flesh and he accomplished everything that he promised the Father he would accomplish. Every citizen of Zion chosen by God came forth in the loins, inseparably united, mystically united. We were in Christ Jesus when he came. He, the Lord said, I lay in Zion a for a foundation of stone. He is a tried stone. Our Lord Jesus came into this earth and he was made under the law and as a man facing every temptation his people face, he walked this earth without sin and was proven a tried stone, pure, holy, undefiled, separate from sinner, sinners, even unto the death of the cross, perfectly obedient to God unto the death of the cross. A tried stone. Sure, so, because he's tried and, 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 and never failing. He's a precious cornerstone. A cornerstone, the foundation that holds the whole structure up is Christ. And he's precious to the Father because God said in him is all my glory. In Christ is all my glory seen. This is when Moses was put in the cleft of the rock and God made all his goodness pass before him. That's what was typified. That was what was being shown to Moses from the cleft of the rock. And we behold that glory in the face of Christ. God's, God the Father looks upon his son and he's precious to him. He upheld the whole law of God. He fulfilled everything written in the law and the prophets. He honored justice. He did all that he said he would do to honor and glorify God, laying down his life for his people. So he's precious to the Father. He saved those the Father loved from eternity and trusted to his Son. That's why he's precious to the Father. And he's precious to you and I who know him because he's all our salvation. We don't bring anything into this thing of salvation or contribute anything to it. If left to us, we would, 
We would destroy it. But he is the he is the precious stone to his people because he's everything in salvation. He is salvation. All our righteousness is him. All our holiness is him. He's the perfection by which we we're going to be brought to God and it's only by him being formed in our heart that we even know God and have this this heart that con, that considers him precious and wants to wants to walk after him and hates what we are by nature what we think what we do and he's the only one that keeps us separated it keeps us separated unto him hedged about as our refuge so that we can never be separated from him. That's why he's precious to us. The Lord said he's the sure foundation. For all these reasons, his church, his holy city, is on a sure foundation that cannot be moved. This is no sinking city that we're in. It's established firmly on Christ the rock, the sure foundation. It's that city that John saw when he said he saw New Jerusalem, the city of God coming down out of heaven adorned as a bride for her husband. And it's adorned by Christ our husband. And he's going to present every member, every citizen of this city to himself one day perfect. We sing the church's one found jetation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and he sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. And then we see here in verse 2, the Lord loveth Zion. He loveth Zion. He says in verse 2, the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. The Lord in Christ loves the church. He loves his holy Zion. He loves each citizen in particular, you who believe. He assembles us to worship him publicly. And this is what he's specifically speaking about here. This, these gates, and he assembles us to worship. And this is what he loves more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Now, our Lord loves all the dwelling places of Jacob. Every, every citizen of this Zion, every chosen, redeemed, regenerated child of God is his. And he loves each one. And he loves where we dwell. His grace is upon his people wherever we are in this world. He loves all the dwelling places of his Jacob. But now he's talking here about when he brings us together to assemble in public worship, this is where he loves more than any. And you think about the whole justified, perfect church, the whole city in heaven that are already there with him, and you think of all his chosen people in this earth that he assembles together. And wherever we are in this world, at whatever time he assembles his people to worship, we're not doing this by ourselves. The word has to come from Christ in Zion, in heavenly Zion, and it has to come down to us from him. And the only way we enter into it and worship him is if he gives us hearts to worship. We can come in, we can go through the motions, but we can't worship him unless he gives us worship in the heart. And you, you just think of this. I like to think of this when we gather and assemble to worship. It's, you know, I hear people say, well, our little, our little assembly. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. There's a heavenly host. Read the Hebrews 12. There's a heavenly host of spirits. You've come to the heavenly Zion. And when we're gathered to worship, this is why the Lord loves his, his Zion, his holy city. is because all eyes in heaven and all eyes here are on him, on Christ. You, you know, people who want to not assemble with God's people, especially now in days of the internet. We're thankful for that. It's good for people, especially that are traveling or sick or that are... are some place where there just is no gospel and they can't, just absolutely have not been able to move. But think about this. What most resembles what we're going to do in glory? What we're doing right here. And this is what the Lord's saying he loves more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. He's the public assembly of his people. Christ has finished the work. He's risen 
up to glory with all his people in him, and now from heavenly Zion, his gospel goes forth into the assemblies he's gathered for public worship in heaven, in earth. Heaven and uh, Zion in heaven are looking to him and praising him, and Zion in earth are looking to him and praising him wherever he's worshiped. He's getting all the glory. He gets the glory for sending the gospel. That gospel glorifies him. The scripture tells us that, that the heavenly host just admires the church and looks at the church with just admiration. Why? Because of Christ. And what's being declared of him and what he's doing and what he has done and what he shall do and who he is. This is why he loves where he's worshipped. It's all of Him. It's all the praise of His glory and His grace. And so all the glory of Zion, whatever can be said about this city, whatever can be said about you and me, it's not said of you and me of ourselves. It's Him. He's the glory of His city. That's why it says in verse 3, Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. The glory of it is Him. He said that. Whenever John saw the heavenly city in Revelation 21, 11, he said it had the glory of God. It had the glory of God. He's the glory that adorns everything. He's, what do we have that we didn't receive from Him? Whatever glorious things are spoken of His holy city, He's the glory of it. It's spoken of Him. So brethren, the glorious things are all of Him. Now secondly, let's look at the citizens of this holy city. Not only does a city need a planner and a foundation, a city's got to have some citizens. Where are these citizens coming from? Verse 4, I will make mention of Rahab. That's Egypt. When you, sometimes when you read Rahab, it's not... When you read Rahab the harlot, it, generally, it usually says Rahab the harlot. When you talk about Egypt, sometimes it just says Rahab. That word means Egypt. I will make mention of Egypt and Babylon to them that know me. This is the Lord speaking. Behold Philistia. Philistia is where the Goliath was. That's where the enemies of, they were always the enemies of God. Tyre, with Ethiopia. The Lord says, I'll say this man was born there. And of Zion it shall be said, this and that man was born in her. And the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count, he'll do a census when he writeth up the people that this man was born there. Now this is all dealing with the citizens. Now, when you think about Egypt and Babylon, those are not those those don't put good things in your mind because in scripture, Egypt's not generally described as a good place to be. That's where the Israelites were in bondage and Pharaoh rejected God. Babylon, the 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 great harlot of false religion is called Babylon, and Babylon was a place they were all carried captive off to. Philistia, where Goliath was, who they hated God all their days. Tyre was a merchant city, where a port city, where all they did was just bring, they just was a thriving city. They didn't have any thought for God whatsoever. Ethiopia. Remember the eunuch came all the way up from Ethiopia to Jerusalem because there wasn't any place to worship God where he was. All those wicked places made up of wicked citizens is where all God's people are when he finds them. That's where we were when he found us. Wicked, fallen, not knowing God, hating God, wanting nothing to do with God. And yet, God says, I have a people in all nations in this world. Don't ever look at a nation or a people or even individuals and think, ah, oh, no hope for them. If God saved this sinner, <laughs> I think all God's people can say this. If he saved me, he can save anybody. If he's preserved me, he can preserve anybody. And he's got people scattered all over this world. He declares he'll call all his elect out of it, all nations. He lists some of those nations here, but there were some nations that didn't exist then. And he got elect in those nations too, like the one we live in. But all of them, 
He knows where they are. He sends this gospel to them. He brings them out of those nations into his holy city. We were first born in this and that nation. Citizens of this and that nation here below. The only way you can be born into this holy, heavenly city is to be born again by the Spirit of God. The only way. The highest himself gets all the glory. He says, the highest himself shall establish her. But when you've been born of him, and you've been brought to faith in Christ, Paul said he not only wrought peace for us by his blood, he came and preached peace to us. The Holy Spirit came and regenerated us and taught us the gospel and called us to him. And he said, now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners. You're fellow citizens with the saints. Fellow citizens of what? Of the holy city of Zion. And the Lord spoken of here has taken a census. He said in verse 6, the Lord shall count. He's going to take a census. He's going to count up all the people in, in Zion when he writeth up the people that this man was born there. And God elected the people in Christ in eternity. The scripture speaks of the Lamb's book of life, which all the names of his elect were written in. And, and they used to be, they used to sing this song when somebody would profess Christ, there's a new name written in glory. There are no new names written in glory. <laughs> the names he wrote in that book in the beginning are the only names he wrote, and they, they are the citizens who shall make up this Zion. And when he takes the final census, there won't be one missing. Christ said, I will not lose one. He will not lose one. Now, all these things, brethren, have been coming to pass. They were coming to pass even in David's day, but this is especially speaking of these last days. Now, get this, because many err here. The last days began when our Lord Jesus came in the flesh. People speak of the last days, and they're looking somewhere way off in the distance to the end of the world. The last days started when Christ came. When Christ came. Hebrews 1 says... God hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. In these last days. That's when they started. When he, you read Isaiah 53, and you see Christ on the cross, and you see him accomplishing the redemption of all his people. And when Christ did that on the cross, and he cried out, it's finished, the veil ran in two in the temple. God declaring all that old covenant system of worship is finished. It's fulfilled by Christ. Here's the one it all spoke to. He finished it. And Christ ended all that Mosaic covenant. He's the fulfillment of it. He brings his people under the everlasting covenant of grace. And then 70 years later, he destroyed political Israel. And then Isaiah 54 declares what Christ has been doing. He declares what he's been doing. He began calling his lost sheep. People are waiting on him to call his lost sheep out of Israel. And then he came to them first in these last days. That's where people mess up. They're looking way down yonder for last days. He came in these last days when he came and he started with his elect in Israel. And then he turned to the Gentiles. And so after Isaiah 53, what does he tell us? In Isaiah 54, he tells the church, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. You didn't bring these children forth. I'm bringing them forth. He said, Enlarge the place of your tent and stretch your stakes out. You're going to need more room. And he said, Thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. You're going to make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not. You'll not be ashamed. You're not going to remember the, the reproach of your widowhood anymore. Why? Thy maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. You see, the saints of old, they knew something of the truth that God not only had a people in that little nation Israel, he had a people all over the world. He's telling, he's telling us in this psalm, in many places in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 54, he's saying, I'm all, I got a people scattered all over the world. I'm the God of the whole world. This is where people mess up when they read the world in the New Testament. Thank God talking about everybody without exception. He's talking about, I got a people all over this world. Some out of Egypt, some out of Babylon, some out of Tyre, some out of America, some out of Israel. But I got a people all over this world. 
Jerusalem, which now is, is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, on the day of Pentecost, the Lord poured out the Spirit of God in a way it had never been done. And Christ, uh, 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 men began to preach in languages, foreign languages they had never heard. The people that spoke those languages understand them in their, understood them in their own language. They weren't speaking some unintelligible language. They were speaking in the language of the people. And Peter stood up and he told them, Christ has done this. The Lord has made that same Jesus whom you crucified. Uh, God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, Lord in Christ. He's done this. And he began saving a multitude. Out of every, there was a multitude out of every nation there. There was a picture right there of what he's doing over the whole course of this gospel age. There was people come up there, not just from Israel. There was people there from all different languages were there. And he saved some out of all of them. And that's what he's been doing ever since. We're living in this day right now, this gospel age, when he's establishing his holy city of Zion, which some people are waiting on for some far distant millennial time. It's happening right now. That's what he's doing. There's never going to be a time when sinners are going to be saved by their works. That's one of the reasons men are looking for that. We're going, everybody's going to come back and have to work out something. No, never. There's never going to be a time when we would turn back to Old Covenant Ju Judaism. It is never happening. God's Israel shall be saved when each elect child is born again into the city of Zion. <laughs> Christ is in heavenly Zion. He's sending His gospel. The Spirit's birthing His redeemed into this city. And by the new birth, through the preaching of the gospel, He's going to do it till He calls the last one. This is what he said in Isaiah 2 and verse 2. It shall come to pass in the last days. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And he shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations, elect out of all nations, shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He'll teach us his ways and we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion, out of heavenly Zion, shall go forth the law, the gospel, and the word of the Lord from heavenly Jerusalem into his earthly assemblies. This is where they are all coming up to the mountain. You came to, the, you came to heavenly Zion tonight. That's what he said in Hebrews 12. You, you've come to Mount Zion, a city that can't be touched. You've come there, and you've come to Christ who speaks from heaven. That's exactly what he said. And he said... He'll judge among the nations. Our God, our Lord Jesus is as working as effectually in His church right now as He was in glory. This is what makes God's people tremble and why we're careful in how we treat one another is because He's the judge judging among the nations and in His city. And He said, He shall rebuke many people. And He's able and He keeps doing this. And you know what happens when He does it? They become peaceable. They beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hunks. And nation stop lifting up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. That doesn't mean he doesn't do that in all the world. You can see that. No nations have stopped lifting up sword against nation. But he does it in his people. So these people stop warring against each other and trying to exalt themselves over others because they're better. You, you live in a sketchy neighborhood. You're this or that. No, we're all just sinners. And now he makes you put away that fleshly difference and see we're one in Christ, in his righteousness. So we say, O oh, house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us walk in his gospel. Let us walk after Christ, the light. He spoke of the strangers, the Gentiles elect, the, uh, his elect among the Gentiles. And he said, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. What is that? That spiritual sacrifice is accepted of God through faith in Christ our altar. 
And this is what he said, For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. That doesn't mean everybody without exception. That means all kinds of people out of all nations. Some rich, some poor, some educated, some educated. Uh, all kinds of sinners, all kinds of people. But he brings them into this one city. Now look at this last thing. Now I'm going to be very brief here. But since all this salvation is due only to our Lord, only by His grace, only by Christ, only through His Spirit, all through His gospel, since He gets all the glory for everything He's doing in building this city, He puts joy in the hearts of His people. His people are a joyful people, rejoicing and praising and glorifying Him. That's what's meant here by the singers and the, and the musicians. He says, verse 7, not only is he going to have all his people there, but all those he calls in, they're going to be joyful. As well, the singers as the players on instruments shall be there. All my springs are in thee. These represent, when you sing and you play, it's joyful. And this represents the joy of his people in his house, in his city. Giving him all the glory. All the Lord's springs are in his people. The springs of spiritual life, of renewing, of reviving, are in his city. Fountains of living water, springs of spiritual peace and spiritual refreshment from Christ Jesus our life. And so all the true citizens of Zion are a joyful people, rejoicing. Not, not, not just putting on a show and hoop de doo and, and jumping around and all that. Rejoicing in our hearts, singing with joy in our hearts to our Lord, in, in our prayers to Him, in our preaching, in our songs we sing, everything is with a joyful heart, giving the glory to the Lord. He said, Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. And you know in uh, Revelation, the song they sang, they sang a new song. When he brings you into this city, you start singing a new song. You were singing a song about, oh, how I love Jesus and everything I did for him. You start singing a new song. Thou art worthy, of, for thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation has made us under our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Citizens of Zion are not looking for some secret rapture. That's not what we're looking for. I know people have been taught these things, and, and I understand people thinking that's something we're looking for. That's not what his people are looking for. You know what we're looking for? We're looking for Christ. <laughs> we're looking for him. It ain't going to be secret. It's not going to be secret. Our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like to his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Brethren, Christ right now is working everything in this world. You know, Everything that you see in politics, everything you see going on between nations, everything you see going on in the world is evil, it's wicked in this nation. Everything that's going on, good, bad, and otherwise. You know why he's doing it? For the furtherance of his gospel. To send this gospel forth to call all of his elect into this holy city through this gospel. I don't know how he's working all that together, but he is. He's working it for you and me to make it so we can send this gospel forth. He said that he won't return to this gospel being preached in every nation. As of right now, just this year, the gospel, just from this place right here, the gospel has been preached in, I think, 90-something countries. That's by the Internet, but it, they, it's been preached there. And he's working everything to make sure his gospel is going into every country. They, he, if he's got a person anywhere in the most remotest place, he's going to get the gospel of Christ to them and bringing them out. So just know that. When, when, after Paul said we're looking for him, 
in Philippians, Paul followed up with this. Therefore, my brethren, dear, dearly beloved, and long for my crown and my joy, so stand fast in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Stand fast in Him. This is what He promises. Isaiah 35.10 The ransomed of the Lord, those He ransomed by the price of His blood, the ransomed of the Lord shall return. They shall come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And you've experienced that who know Him. You've, all, you've returned. All His elect are going to return to Zion. And then we're all going to that grand assembly in glory with Him. So stand fast in Him. Nothing Nothing is failing. He shall not fail. He's going to do everything to bring His gospel to His people and that's what He's doing right now. Father, we thank You for this word. Lord, bless it to encourage the hearts of Your people. Make us to see how pleased You are with this city that You purposed and that You erected and laid the foundation for this city you love, this people that you're protecting. and Lord, you called us out when we didn't know you, when we couldn't have known you. You did all of that by sending us the gospel, assembling your people together. Let that be a reminder to us continually, Lord, that you won't have any problem keeping your church protected, keeping your gospel going forth, calling out your people. We're as helpless to, to do this work ourselves now as we were when we were fumbling around in total darkness. Lord, shine your light. Enlighten our hearts. Give us strength for this, for this work you've put in our hands to preach your word. Make us remember it's all of you. It's all of your glory. Keep us turned from ourselves, from our sins, from our vain notions that there's something in us that contributes to this work of salvation. Lord, keep joy in our hearts. We, we, we pray, keep us seeing Christ, our joy, our rejoicing, how sure this foundation is, and keep joy in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for your peace, for your joy. Lord, thank you for making your people a happy people. We don't have anything, we don't have anything to be sorrowful about. If we just look up, if we just look to you and see the rejoicing and the and the good that you've wrought for us and what you've made us by your blood and your righteousness. Lord, forgive us for our weakness, forgive us for our unbelief, forgive us for our sins, forgive us for, forgive us. Lord, look, look to Christ. Behold us united inseparably in Him and let us be found only in Him. Do what you do for your people for Christ's sake. Protect us, Lord. We need, we need you protecting us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.